Carrying on for the afternoon, we've got Andrew Bow from Catalyst talking about orchestration war, war stories. Thank you very much. Uh, you can all hear me okay? Yep, that was going well. So, my name's Andrew Bogue. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity for presenting to such an impressive crowd. I actually can <laughs> conceptualise a much smaller event, given that it was a mini-conf, but it's great that um, we've got the opportunity to share some of our learnings. So, what I've aimed to do with this talk is to really talk about the things we have seen and done based on using the tool sets that were decided upon by the team and the client to solve orchestration and cloud-based infrastructure challenges. So just talk a little bit about what we have done. So I'm the, I'm the managing director of the Australian end of Catalyst business. So we've got about 35 staff and we've had a fairly big involvement with AWS since the launch of the platform in November 2012. So you know, we've, our broad uh, sort of experience with AWS as, as an infrastructure as a service offering has been, you know, we've done hand rolled stacks and infrastructure with just sort of wrestling things up using the GUI and connecting to machines. Uh, we have used the golden master, you know, red green deployment, uh, stateless immutable sort of approach in which you, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. And we've also done, use Opsworks. Now Opsworks is sort of your close, your real deal, uh, you know, orchestration tool, uh, which sort of allows you to deploy stacks as code, right? I mean, I, there, there are other methods, methodologies, but Opsworks looked very appealing to us at the time, and we got a lot of buy-in from the client, which is actually one of the ways we've been able to learn so much, um, because his, still, even out there in the world of cloud, there is still a lot of essentially lift and shift from, from what we're seeing, where you're basically just taking your existing infrastructure, your existing applications, and you're picking them up from somewhere, whether that's physical infrastructure or VMware or whatever, and you're just putting it into a cloud using you know, a subset of the available tools without heavily re-architecting because of budgetary constraints. And, and there's still worth even to lift and shift because you might spend less on infrastructure, right? It might give you some better um, you know, <coughs> redundancy uh, offerings and stuff like that. Uh, but thankfully, we were, really, uh, we were able to build an application f pretty much from the ground up, um, well, a oh, stack actually, which, which, which was fun. So I'll just talk a wee bit about the Golden Master deployment model. I mean, do you guys use, has anyone used this sort of deployment model, Golden Master, Red Green deployment, anyone? I'll assume you're just shy. So um, what we've got here, the, the, magical, uh, the magical instance here is this one called the EC2 admin instance, right? So what that is, I mean, this is your typical LAMP type stack where you've got an application server and then bits connected to it. You know, you've got databases and caching servers and a clustered file system at the back, GlusterFS down there. Um, and over to the right, you've got this auto scale group, which is the AWS magic of being able to define an, order, an auto scale group based on a, an, AM, an AME, an EC2 snapshot, a compute snapshot, right? So these things are considered immutable in the sense that they don't have any state. Well, I suppose technically they do have a state, you know, they've got a bit of caching stuff going on, but they're writing their syslog, they're writing their logging out to an external server, it's a syslog out on the right, they're, they're doing all their file operations with a, a, a clustered file system, a network file system, they're talking to RDS as their database and they're using external caching servers. So there's sort of that real cattle versus sheep type thing where you can kill them and away you just get an Another one, right? So these, and the way we build this snapshot, the way we create these instances to use, um, you know, for, for let's say we've got an upgrade to an application of, of some sort, then we actually do all the changes on the EC2 admin instance, which is sort of off to the side and is not in front of the internet. There is no URL you can get to to get to it, although you can cook, you, you can do sort of cookery on ETC host and get to it if you need to. And we will deploy changes to that. It still has a live connection to the files and to the database and to all those things, but it's just not part of the uh, not part of the sort of the compute muscle that's servicing requests from the ELBs. The ELBs are load balancers in, um, in, in Amazon speak. So this has, been, this has been quite successful. This was our first sort of orchestration approach and it gave us a lot of flexibility around we can use very conventional tools to manage the EC2 admin instance because it's just a server. It's just a Linux server. I mean, we're, we're, we're pretty much exclusively Ubuntu Linux. So there was all sorts of ways we could manage that and we're very, very comfortable with that, right? And then you fire off an API call into AWS land and it takes a snapshot of that EC2 instance, of the uh, admin instance and then rolls it into the load balancer. Right? So you just simply kill off the old ones and move the new ones in. And there's, there's a couple of approaches depending on how much what level of comfort you've got around you know, things like upgrades running and stuff but it's pretty flexible and it allowed us to do seamless, out, seamless upgrades. 
So we came along, so after doing that for one of our bigger projects for our clients, uh, the next step was much more of a, you know, a proper orchestration layer. Uh, and the thing that came to the attention of both ourselves, we actually proposed it to the client, but the client liked it. They're very, very technically capable and they, they really wanted buy-in for all these decisions, was Opsworks. Now, Opsworks was pretty, I mean, it's been around for a while now uh, in AWS speak. Uh, it is, you know, by our definition, orchestration is infrastructure as code, right? So it is your entire, the holy grail is your entire stack is defined as code that's in a version control system somewhere, right? Or, or not. But that's obviously a great way of doing it. So Opsworks is an AWS service. I believe they bought it off someone, um, but I don't know the details of that. It's, you know, orchestration as a service. You don't actually pay for it. You just pay for the, you, for the resources that you use when using Opsworks. So that makes sense for AWS. It allows you to, you know, use their infrastructure and you get charged for that. Um, it does provisioning, it does management, it does deployment, it plays well with um, continuous integration, continuous delivery, which is what we were using heavily. So it was sort of push button deploys um, and all tied together with Jira and Bitbucket and HipChat and all that sort of stuff, which is very much driven by the client. Um, and, you know, and once again, the client was heavily involved in technical decisions and really did know what they were talking about and understood the, the sort of rules of the game for this world. So, summary of what Opsworks is, it's stack as code. Uh, I'm not trying to sell Opsworks in any way, shape or form. Uh, it, it's stack as code, it goes in a Git repo. It you know, gives you methodology to layer the stack. Uh, it's based on chef recipes, not Puppet. Ideological discussions around chef versus Puppet, there's lots of room for that. Um, ERB templates is sort of the methodology of divining templates as you know, compute nodes. There's lots of existing recipes. And you can now actually recently, although I'm not sure if I would, you can actually run Opsworks outside of AWS now on your own infrastructure. So you can actually run some agent, I'm sure there is a requirements in terms of what you run it on, but you run some agent and you get, and you get charged by hour <laughs> in the same sort of way, even running it on your infrastructure, which in theory, in theory allows you to do this whole um, uh, portable workload type thing that is sort of the buzzword in infrastructure as a service around at the moment. So well, we haven't done that. It was quite a recent uh, development that it was around. So in practice, we define servers in layers. You know, there's your cache layer, your front end, your Gluster, um, your RDS. It, it, Opsworks does do auto scaling, but not as well as just plain auto scaling. Um, you don't have as many metrics by which you can make rules, which was limiting. Um, you can do some interesting stuff with temporal rules, which is a really good thing to do for a whole pile of environments that lie around in big enterprises, because they just turn them on and forget to turn them off, and they get charged for it. So it's really cool to be able to say, you know, this should run basically during extended business hours, or you know, and you can still turn it on, but uh, but the rules aren't, aren't super slick, but you can do that. It has this has this has an auto healing functionality, uh, which actually came on, which was a big problem for us when it came unstuck, because it depended on the, the mother ship, which was in the states. And at the point when it lost connectivity between, you know, the data center, the region, uh, the Sydney region, and the, the states, then it started doing some pretty strange things. Even though it could see the internet and the clients were using it and all that stuff, but we turned off auto healing and that fixed that problem. So the things that we don't like, and this is received from the team. I mean, we've been using it now fairly heavily for well over. A year. Um, it has some communications dependencies. It has some dependencies that we're not fully comfortable with. Uh, we we ended up doing the whole build from scratch, build your node, your compute node from scratch every time. So you you deploy a new EC2 instance, which is Ubuntu LTS something. You then start installing packages and running recipes and all that sort of stuff, which is good for some things, but really not that good for others. Like auto scaling isn't very meaningful in that context because it takes far too long to build an instance to save you from a load spike. You know, like even in the best cases, auto scaling isn't actually the magic wand that it looks like in the beginning. Um, so we would have been faster going with an AMI approach, but that was just a re-engineering that no one was prepared to pay for. Uh, you know, here's a contentious statement that other people have made, so I'll just repeat it, is that learning chef is, a, the learning curve for chef is steeper than Puppet, right? That's what, that's what some of my guys say. They had come from Puppet to chef, and they, didn't, they liked Puppet more. But then one of my guys went completely chef, and now they have arguments on IC about which one's better, and, you know. But the, we're, we're probably leaning back in the direction of Puppet, in all honesty. Um, look, there is an element of lock-in with Opsworks, and I think that's probably the case for any complicated orchestration framework at the moment, because, you know, it do, they do things in certain ways, um, especially with AWS, you're making use of uh, offerings that no one else has. So, you know, the, I mean, I don't like the term lock-in as much in this context, much as really there's a cost to change, right? There's a cost to moving away, which is, you know, non-trivial. 
So where we sort of got to and where we are is we have the ability to, uh, to create a full stack rebuild at the press of a button, right? Now this means that we can replicate a recently built production state, you know, the, the, database, the data might be as much as an hour old, but we can, at the press of a button, replicate the entire stack, which is front ends, databases, ca uh, caching servers, uh, Gluster, and uh, all the state of that data within about um, 20 to 40 minutes. It depends, and a lot of that time is actually restoring the database. So it's pretty nifty in that you can press a button and away you go, and there's another stack. And then you can press a button again and away you go, and there's another stack. And you know that was very, very useful for some parts of the project. We could use that for disaster recovery purposes in terms of starting a, um, launching an instance in another region, uh, although there's a lot of discussion around that in terms of the data implications and, and stuff. Uh, I mean, everyone likes that idea, but it was never done. I mean, obviously it's a lot nicer if the whole region doesn't just go away. Um, in terms of your ability to load test, it is awesome, right? Like, so you can just go, hey guys, I wanna do a big round of load testing, press a button, and you know, you've got a whole stack good to go, and go nuts, load test the, the, the shivers out of it, and then you put it back down again. And that's something that historically has been quite challenging because you didn't have physical machines lying around that you were always able to use that were one for one match with production, and it was just, it was challenging. Um, well, if we did it again, right, so if we did it all again, we would use uh, Amy based, which is snapshot based solutions, rather than call home and tell me what I need to be, because you, you can get faster launches. Uh, Opsworks wouldn't be suitable for all of our AWS stacks because of the way they, they need to scale based on order scale rules. Um, the golden master approach is probably still more flexible, it, although it, you, you step slightly further away from this, my whole stack is code inside a version control system. You might have some stuff that people just go in there and change, right? But that's sort of a bit close to the old school. But there are times when that is really convenient, especially when the, the, the wheels are coming off, that you can just go and make changes. Um, there was also discussions about, of course, re-engineering our own version of sort of what Opsworks does with some more improvements using Puppet and doing all sorts of other things. But funnily enough, the client wasn't terribly keen on paying for it because they didn't necessarily see... Uh, I mean, they, they understand the pain points, but it's also a very sophisticated and mature your piece of kit. Um, so just a bit about auto-scaling and, and sort of when we first saw auto-scaling and the capabilities that it offered us, we thought, oh my God, the world is now a eureka moment. Uh, we just don't need to worry about, you know, we're going to spend so much more, less money. We're going to be able to make these incredibly tolerant systems that will be able to tolerate any load spikes. The reality of it is it isn't quite the magic bullet that you think it might be. Um, you cannot still just broadly under-provision because you will have to have a reasonable outage before auto-scaling kicks in enough to save the day. So you still have to be paying attention to what the requirements of your system are and you can't just completely under-provision under the hope that auto-scaling is going to save the day. Um, not, all of the, not all of the computer instances you bring up in an, an auto-scaling event are actually completely ready to go and they could actually cause you a bottleneck. And one of the problems we found was that APC cache in PHP needed to sort of be pre-warmed in, in order to comfortably throw it into a, a heavy load environment uh, because it might actually make things worse. You really need to load test auto scaling and understand what the symptoms, what the scenarios are around it launching, uh, because you sort of really want to get that. Because if you get it wrong, you know suddenly you end up auto scaling all the time, and you spend more money than you need to. You, you need to understand what a suitable set of rules are around firing up new instances. Um, so I'll tell my chat story. Um, we had a we got a large application which is a learning management system and a content management system, Moodle and Drupal. They're attached. You know they're that are in that stack that I already uh, explained, and we were put we put inside that a chat application, which was a PHP application, which was basically brokenly engineered, and polled the database every 30 seconds or every 10 seconds from inside the window. I mean, you've seen the pop-up chat uh, chat applications on the web. This one basically polled the database every five seconds, saying, "Have I got any message yet? Have I got any message yet? Have I got any message yet?" So while someone is on the page and going away and having a coffee for two hours or lunch, that JavaScript is constantly pounding the server, and guess what? It sent RDS into a meltdown, right? So it just completely drowned, it flatlined the database, and we didn't get that much, um, uh, we didn't get that much savior out of the front-end auto-scaling, because it was all about the back-end anyway, right? They were basically just passing on requests to the back-end. So we managed to wrestle enough 
We managed to wrestle enough of the work into a caching layer and put it into the front end land so the database was left alone. And so what happened after that was instead of having four front ends working, we had 20. So it was scaled and we went up to 20 and the application dealt with the load. But the client now has to pay two or $3,000 more a month to run the infrastructure. And that's an interesting discussion, is that generally our background has been fix it, make it work, which we did, but within the constraints of the, of, the, of the task, and yet still our solution isn't completely good because it's going to cost them a lot more. And it, it makes them understand the value, I mean, the cost of these things. And what they needed to do was, was use a different chat solution, which, which they will if they decide to, and we found we proposed a different one. But it was, that was a different symptom of using infrastructure as a service because in traditional sense, if you just had X amount of servers, you would have basically either turned off chat or maybe done some magical tuning of the database or just watched it you know, descend into a ball of flames. You, you wouldn't have had any, terribly many more options other than that. Um, and this is, this is new. This is, this is what we're allowed to do. So resource upgrade policy quickly. You can very much get distracted with an organisation when you have to ask them, can we use a bigger RDS or can we use a bigger EC2 instance? And they sort of look at you blankly and go, I don't know. You know? And actually what we've done now is we're just going to upgrade it. If, it. if the system is breaking and we need it, then we'll just turn it up because it costs them 25 bucks a day. And they need, to, uh, they need to talk about it and we need to have a meeting and all that stuff and that's fine. But in the short term, we're just going to turn up the volume. Monitoring auto scaling is also quite challenging, but I haven't got time to talk about that. Um, spend, you know, once upon a time, you know, the technical people didn't really need to think about spend so much in terms of managing infrastructure because there was a cost for a number of servers and maybe a pile of data, but now the cost of this whole stack and, you know, staging and continuous integration environments are really interesting in terms of what they affect the spend. You sort of have to have discussions with the client that you didn't before because they want to know, you know, why suddenly the, they spent $5,000 more in a month and you have to tell them and it might be something to do with you and it might be something to do with them. But uh, it's, it's a new type of discussion and it actually gives us, the way we look at it, is it gives us the opportunity to bring more value to, to what we're doing for them. And that we can say, well, what about this? And have you thought about doing this? And how about you turn off some of the um, environments you've got running? So Catalyst New Year AWS tips. How many of you are using AWS in some way, shape or form? Right? For clients? Okay, you should have dual factor authentication with CloudTrail cloud enabled. You should. There is no, there is no argument not to. If you, uh, the, the concept of someone being able to maliciously or accidentally or in any way, shape or form get your login credentials and erase your cloud existence is pretty frightening, right? So you should have dual factor authentication enabled. It is not that hard to set up. There's a number of ways of doing it. If you want to come and talk to me about the ways we've done it, please feel free. That should be, that should be business as usual, right? Like it's not for everyone, but that is just so important with CloudTrail. So you've got some level of, um, of auditability. The other one, uh, the other tip we'll throw out there is no single person, no matter how trusted or intelligent or uber geek they are, or, how much, or whether they own the company, should have the credentials or ability to be able to delete all the copies of your snapshots. Right? There is no AWS account that can go in there and hit delete, 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 and remove it all. There should be at least, it should require, there should be copies of the data in places or using tools that mean it will take two people to go in there in order to delete that data. Because it's accidental, because hey, people make mistakes, boom, you could go. It is a malicious staff member who gets fired and decides that you guys are all dicks, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna show you, uh, or it's getting hacked. Right, so you want to be able to say uh, that we, there is no, as well as, you used to talk about data being stored in three different physical locations, and now you want to say that as well as saying that there is no one person in my environment or in your environment who can delete this data, right? I mean, they could delete a copy of it, but there will be another copy somewhere else and you can come in and save the day, right? So that's, if, if you want to come and talk to me about how we've done that, I'm happy to discuss that. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of flexibility in how you might do that. So more tips for beer later on in the evening. Um, so there will be no demos. There will be no demos. My sysadmins, when I said, shall I do a demo? They sort of smiled and then I know afterwards they said, don't let him do a demo. Do not let him do a demo. So there's no demos. And uh, really, it's about the application as opposed to sort of looking at an OpsWorks interface that just looks like the, the AWS console in many ways. Um, I would love to hear some questions. I think I've got the time for one or two, maybe. You get it. You have a minutes. Yeah. Uh, did you play with the cloud formation at all before going to OpsWorks? And if so, if we, so uh, an opinion between the two. So we did, um, and for the way we were, when we went down the OpsWorks uh, 
journey when we went down that direction. We, we looked at cloud formation and it just seemed to be more work uh, than OpsWorks to do what we wanted to do. But we're, certainly look, we're actually looking at it again now um, because we think it might give us some things that OpsWorks doesn't. Like we wouldn't, we wouldn't use OpsWorks again unless it was sort of mandated to us and we probably wouldn't propose it. We've sort of all fallen a little bit out of love with it. Um, so cloud formation, yes, it, it, it wasn't... Um, it didn't look easy, right, from when we played with it, but we're, we're, doing, another we're doing, doing another proof of concept now. Does it play well with OpenStack? Sorry? Your, 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 your environment. How well, it's, it's not play? agnostic to uh, cloud providers, so it's, a, it's an AWS tool. Um, the, the closest, from what I know, I'm, I'm not an OpenStack expert, but it's um, Heat. Heat is sort of the, that same thing, and I haven't seen a detailed, um, a detailed examination of the feature match, but there are, off, there are offerings in AWS that OpenStack doesn't have, so it's going to be different. Uh, and this is very much an, an AWS tool. Interop Interoperable. Between, any interoperation between the two stacks? Your Sorry, interoperative? Uh, yeah, in, 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 interoperation between the two environments in, from your perspective. From our perspective, I think that's a tricky one. I honestly am still, the, ju the jury's still out actually in this, in this cloud agnostic deployment methodologies because you end up getting the lowest common denominator. And like the reality is, a lot of what AWS has to offer, I start sounding like an AWS salesman, which I don't really want to, but the, a lot of what AWS has to offer is some of these, these, this bleeding edge technology, right? Like that actually makes sense. You know, the fact that you can just click a few buttons and there's a read replica for my RDS, you know, or, or the queuing service. And I know that, you know, these things exist to some degree in OpenStack. It's generally a subset of the offering, right? So all these little bits and pieces that really make your life easier are, are what we tended to use. And so you, yes, you could build these things, and that's why I talk about cost of exit as opposed to like lock-in, because you could do it all on any cloud platform, right? But, you know, there'd be some things you'd have to build. And, and you know, it's a changing ecosphere, I realise that, so these things, and there will be things that OpenStack does that AWS doesn't, or, uh, well, you know, someone using OpenStack does. So, but at the moment, uh, we've been very centric towards AWS, and that was once again the client's decision as well. They were telling us we want AWS. They weren't coming to us for a recommendation of a cloud provider. Any, one more question, then we'll move on to uh, Sven. Yeah. Um, you said that you keep the data in two separate locations. I'm assuming they're in two separate accounts, and that's. Uh, well, they're actually in more than that. They're in different cloud providers as well. But yes, different accounts. AWS different accounts. Yeah. So, wouldn't the script that copies the data from one account to the other have to have access to both accounts? Read access. So, the machine actually, the way we do it is that the, 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 the so there's the catalyst accounts, right, which have stuff, and then there's an account over there that's mine, and there's an account over there that's my operations manager, and that just has read, that has, it connects and pulls data back, so, and it doesn't delete. So even if you wiped everything off our joint account, it would connect and try and sync, and so well, there's no data there, but it wouldn't go and wipe all of the historic data. Right. So you wouldn't, there's no way that, it, that the central, if you compromise these internal machines, all they could do is shut down access. They couldn't actually, they couldn't poison the state of the external servers. But there's a number of ways you could do that, and I've, we've got some new ideas. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.